All right. Hello, everybody. Hey, friends. We're all we're online now. Uh, I'm I'm here with Dan Phelps. Some of you may know him as uh, as a well-known geologist out of Kentucky, but let me in allow him to introduce himself first. Oh well, thank you, PZ. I'm Dan Phelps. Um, I'm a geologist. I'm retired from government. I've taught at the community college level and currently run um, the amateur organization, the Kentucky Paleontological Society. But as a side hobby, I've been um, here in Kentucky since Answers in Genesis got here and um, have spent a lot of time investigating the Ark and the Creation Museum and the various um, perks they've received from both state, uh, local, and city governments here in Kentucky, many of which are outrageous. Um, I was a major participant in the documentary film called We Believe in Dinosaurs that documented the, um, the building of the Ark and the various uh, perks they received and how I almost kept them from receiving 18 and a quarter million dollars in tax incentives. Ah, yeah, the millions of dollars they have received <laughs> is just, just appalling. So that, that was on Netflix. Is it still on Netflix? Do you know? Oh, it's on various um, uh, streaming services. If you're a PBS member and donate to your local PBS station, you can get Passport and it's on there. You can get DVDs of it uh, on Amazon. Um, in fact, right now, the, the creationists have mounted over the years a um, negative campaign against it. When the film first came out, it had really great reviews from all the critics. Um, and the initial reviews on places like the Internet Movie Database were great. And then all at once, uh, Eric Covent apparently orchestrated some sort of campaign to um, drive down the ratings on both, um, both Amazon and Internet Movie Database. So if you've watched the film, go out and review it. Whatever, even if you don't like oh. it, review it as long as it's an honest review. And if you haven't watched, go watch it. It's pretty good. Yeah, all the shenanigans going on behind the Creation Museum, uh, which is also kind of current. He's in the news because uh, what's his name was the guy behind the donation of the fossil. Peroka, the, yeah, Michael yeah. Peroka, the Neil yeah. Confederate white oh. supremacist. <laughs> Yeah, they, they have got some unsavory characters behind Answers in Genesis. So it's, it's, uh, anyway, so yeah, watch that. Uh, today, well, I should mention, I'm PZ Myers, I'm a biologist. So we've got a geologist and a biologist here to complement each other as we discuss uh, their excuses for Noah's Ark. Uh, I, I teach at the University of Minnesota Morris up here far away from the Ark. I'm in Minnesota. I have visited the Creation Museum and the Ark. I will recommend that nobody do that. <laughs> Unless you it, give them free. Yes, get don't, in free. Don't give them any can. money. Don't give them any money. Yeah, because they're they are so overpriced. I was kind of blown over just by the cost of parking at that place. But yeah, and then it's mostly empty. So it's it's not a very interesting museum to go to. Well, Cincinnati really, has. You, know, you end up reading signs on the wall for the most yeah, part. Lots of signs, lots of dioramas, uh, lots of empty floor space with kids and old people running around. Uh, it's it's uh, not very interesting. And there are good museums in Cincinnati and places around that go there instead. And most museums are relatively inexpensive compared to what the Ark Park is charging. I really recommend the Cincinnati Museum Center. I'm always donating specimens, including fossils and different things to them. And yes. they'll be covered in my will even. <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky, unfortunately, has two creation museums, but no natural history museum. Really? Oh, that's a shame. Our university has so many neat specimens tucked away that the public just doesn't get to see them. We uh -huh. tried putting together a group to have a natural history museum here in Kentucky years back. And okay. we talked and talked and talked about it, but we never got any money. And Ken Ham came to Kentucky and raised the money and has two creation museums. 
and we have no natural history museum. Oh, well, it tells you a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it? It does. Yeah. Yeah. I do. We have a, I don't think we have a, we have a, a little creationist organization and I think they've got what they call a sort of museum running out of a garage or something, but that's about it. And we do have the Bell Museum and the Science Museum of Minnesota all near the Twin Cities area. So we get some good stuff here. Go to that instead. Okay, shall we dig into this this horrible, horrible thing? Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Well, so here's here's my plan: is uh, the answers in Genesis came out with this really boring hour long video of uh, what's his name, Tim Chaffee or something, uh, yeah. talking, just babbling away about the ark. And uh, they edit it down, which is very convenient. They cut out all the boring parts, which if, if you'd asked me, they should have cut out the whole thing. But anyway, they trimmed it down to 21 minutes and something. And that's convenient. And they also conveniently provided an index to all the comments they were going to make. They're going to go through 20, what is it, 20 questions, which aren't really questions that anybody really cared about. They're going to go through them. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play sections of this video uninterrupted. And then Dan and I will rebut them at the end of each section. So uh, let's fire it up. Let's, I, hope, I hope the sound yeah, works. The, the way they edited it was really interesting, too. It, it, he comes off like um, a quick edit, like the old Miami Vice TV show or uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks. It, he really comes off as being over caffeinated too. Yes. Yeah, I do think they sped it up a little, and then they use lots of jump kit cuts to trim it down, and so it's kind of a herky jerky video. But it does nicely cut it down to just the stuff we want to talk about. So, well, still a lot of stuff we don't want to talk about, but we'll go. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this this first. What was it? First 42 seconds. I'll let Tim just babble and then we'll we'll address that. And let me know if the sound doesn't work. I'll be watching the the chat. What I want to do is go over some of the skeptical questions that people have about Noah and about the ark and about the flood. So let's deal with some of these skeptical questions. How did he fit all the animals on the ark? And we've heard all sorts of crazy numbers. I get email. Oh. Oh. Yes, I, I guess it was quicker than that it was again really they really chopped it up a lot uh so this is our first question is how did noah fit all the animals on the ark let's see how they explain it and how did he fit all six million how did he fit all eight million species how did he fit 11 million species i've heard 80 million species it's like they're just pulling numbers out of a hat one of the skeptics he put this picture in his rebuttal trying to make the ark look silly do you guys see anything that looks sort of fishy i understand whales are not fish technically but why would he have to bring the whales? The last time I checked, there would have been a pretty big pond outside the ark during the flood. In fact, it was bigger than the oceans had ever been before. He wouldn't have to bring the sea creatures. So let me ask you this. What do we have to know in order to answer this question? How could he fit all the animals on board the ark? How many animals? How big was the ark? So in order to fix... Okay, that's a good place to stop. So, uh, yeah, so the question is, how did Noah fit all the animals on the ark? And he, he throws a couple of... Uh, he throws one image up there and his points are that it's just it's just the skeptics trying to make them look silly that uh th that he didn't have to include whales on the ark oh boy oh boy yeah well that's because there was this big pond out there what he doesn't mention though is that the creationists use Noah's flood to explain all of geology, almost all of geology. So you got this gigantic flood, this huge storm that is carving out the Grand Canyon, that is throwing up the mountains, that is just ripping everything to shreds. It's killing all life on earth. And yet he thinks, oh, well, we don't need to carry out any whales on board. How would the whales have survived all that, is my question. 
uh, the sediment um, mixed in with the water would have been really bad and the salinity problems. And I mean, there's a whole laundry list of things that they basically just ignore. Right. Yeah. They're, they're acting as if the entire ocean was this placid, calm place, unchanged, the plankton unaffected, no, no changes to the salinity or the temperature or the turbidity of the water. Oh, we don't need to worry about, we don't need to worry about whales or fish. Yeah. What did they filter feed? <laughs> you know, but again, you know, it's all made up. So, so much of this video is like fan fiction for Star Trek or Lord of the Rings or something like that. Right. Yes. And then they're going to go on and they're going to say that there's a whole ca whole categories of organisms that they didn't need to include. They didn't need to include bacteria. They didn't need to include marine animals. They didn't need to include insects, which will come up in this next bit. And that's also a lot of bogus nonsense because insects have very specific requirements for their environment. You can't just you can't just take an insect and put it anywhere and it will thrive. Uh, you've got all these terrestrial insects. How were they making it through this 150 days of flooding? They don't talk about that. That's. Uh, I would also argue that the bacteria are also relevant because, believe it or not, bacteria do have specific requirements for survival. They can live in environments we find very hostile, but to just say, oh, well, no, no change. We just turn the entire world into an ocean and all the bacteria are fine. Yeah. One of the best takedowns of all this was actually written by Mark Twain. His um, book, uh, Letters from the Earth, it wasn't published until 50 years after he was dead in the 1960s. But it has um, Mark Twain's account of the flood and all the prehistoric animals show up for the ark. And the ark has to go back to port to pick up a fly that's carrying all the diseases like typhoid and stuff. Right. Yes. And, and which members of Noah's family had uh, venereal diseases. And, you know, it, there's all these <laughs> hilarious things that Mark Twain brings up writing about 1905 or so that top anything any atheist or skeptic can come up with today. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're kind of just glossing over all the mutual interdependencies of modern organisms to say that they could all thrive on this artificial arc. Uh, that's going to be kind of a theme here is they're going to just sort of gloss over everything and then fall back on the Bible says so. So uh, this Nick. Yeah. And so the, the, Go ahead. The famous Sidney Harris cartoon, then a miracle occurred. Oh, right. You need to more yes. be a, more explicit at that particular step. They are going to invoke miracles a few times too. Okay. So right there on the screen, you can see we've got the next two questions. How many animals and how big was the ark? Uh, the, the argument about how many animals is the longest segment of this whole thing. It's like four and a half minutes, I think. Uh, they're going to get very specific here, which is kind of nice. And I think they went on at length because this is the only part where they use math, which sounds kind of semi-sciencey. So let's, let's let Tim just babble away about how many animals were on the ark. Figure out the size of the ark. Let's take a look what the Bible tells us. It gives us the answer to this one. We know the size, roughly. The length of it shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. Which cubit did they use? Well, the common cubit in biblical times in Israel, when they were in Jerusalem at Hezekiah's tunnel, we can look at the cubit that was used for that. It's 17 and a half inches. Some Nobody cares say 18 about inches. this. Somewhere in that range is the common <laughs> cubit. Now, many of the ancient building constructions were done on what's called a royal cubit or a long cubit. You take this measurement and then you would add the four fingers to it. So that would be a royal or a long cubit. So what we did is we took one of the shortest of the common cubits and then made a long cubit out of that by adding 2.9 inches. You get 20.4 inches. So our arc is 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet tall for a total volume of 1.88 million cubic feet. We subtracted 15% for the volume because of the curvature of the hull and everything. Now, how big is that? Well, this is what it looks like next to a football field. Okay, it's huge. So how many animals had to go on the arc? Well, here's from the... Wait, I, have to, I have to comment on this. Uh, that if you go to the Ark Park and you go on the tour, that this is something they just repeat over and over again. Gosh, how big this thing is. Lots of statistics on dimensions and numbers. 
And and again, we don't care because uh, none of it's going to work. How big was the USS Enterprise? Yeah. yeah. You can yeah. just. That's all that matters. So anyway, we're going to hear about how many animals there were. Journal Science, we argue the number of species on Earth today is five plus or minus three million, of which 1.5 million are named. Don't you like how specific they are? Anywhere from two to eight million. We've identified 1.5 million and we're estimating there's this many more. The IUCN red list, which is what we use for the endangered species list, they say there's 1.78 million species. But here's what they're not telling you. They are including all of the bacteria and one-celled organisms that have ever been identified. If Noah had to bring those, they would not take up much space. They are including all of the marine creatures. Remember the whales that you saw in the one picture? Most of the life on Earth is in the oceans. They're including all of the marine creatures. He didn't have to bring the marine life. He didn't have to bring yes, the fish or the eels or anything like that. They're including a million different species of insects. He probably did not need to bring insects. Maybe the more delicate ones like butterflies and moths and bees, but they don't match the description of the animals that had to go on board the ark. And we're dealing with kinds, not species. What's the difference? Well, if you think of the classification system that we have, so you have kingdom, phylum, class, order, and then family, genus, species. A lot of times people think, oh, you had to bring all these different species. No, the kind level is roughly equivalent to the family, so you go up a couple levels. It's not always equivalent there, but think about it this way. These are all different species of Tyrannosaur. Did he have to bring two of every one of those? Now, we think of just this guy here, the biggest and the baddest and the coolest, the T-Rex. But all of these are classified as different species of Tyrannosaur. What if what God brought to Noah was something like this, one of the smaller ones, fully grown. They don't take up as much space, do they? There's a lot of different ways to think about it. Here's one way we'd talk about it at the ark. Noah didn't have to bring all of these, all of the biggest ones that you could possibly find. He just needed two of these. He didn't need to bring any of these, any of the marine creatures. I know it seems silly to even have to say that, but because they include it so often, we had to make a point of it. But he did have to bring animals that are now considered extinct. If you think about the way you usually think about the ark, what animals are on there? Well, you got giraffe, you might have elephant, you got a lion, you got a monkey, you got a snake, and maybe a, a rhino or a hippo, right? Well, we didn't want to do it that way. We to give a more realistic picture. We did about 50% that people would recognize and 50% that are now extinct since the time of the flood. So you'll see a more diverse picture than what you're used to seeing when you're there. How many of each kind had to go on board the ark? The Bible talks about two of every kind will come to you, but then he clarifies in the next chapter, just a couple of sentences later, that there's going to be seven or seven pairs of all the clean animals and the flying creatures are going to come to him. So is it seven or seven pairs? Well, it depends on which Bible you use. Why is there a difference? Well, the Hebrew phrase is seven, seven, a male and his female. Seven and it's just kind of stressing the seven, or is it 14? It kind of sounds like 14, but here's what we did. Every single time there was an option between a lower number and a higher number, we always went with the higher number because we don't want somebody to think that we cheated. When we say, yeah, you can fit all the animals on board, and they're like, well, yeah, but that's because you took the lower numbers. No, we went with the higher numbers all the time. And we did the same thing when it comes to what we call splitting or lumping. What does that mean? Well, if you think about the different animals that belong in the same kind, so think about dogs. You got wolves and dingoes and coyotes, foxes belong in there. Those are all dogs. They're all part of the dog kind. He didn't need two of each of those. He just needs two dogs with a genetic variability for what we see today. And that same principle is for so many other animals. But we don't always have the information. We need all the hybrid data to know whether or not one species can interbreed with another. And so if we don't have that information, we split them into different kinds. So our number is probably overestimated by quite a bit. So how many animals had to go on board the ark? Well, we had to count them all. And you can read the list on our website. In fact, you can look at the academic papers on these. How many amphibians? 194 kinds that are still around today. And that number, again, is probably greatly inflated. So 388 total because you multiply it by two. Same thing with reptiles. Birds, you're multiplying most of those by 14 because most of them are flying creatures. There's some that are flightless. The mammals, some of those get multiplied by 14 because some of them are clean animals like the cattle, the sheep, that kind of thing. And some of them are flying creatures like the bats. In fact, we have over 300 bats on board the ark. So how many extinct animals? Well, there's the numbers. Does that add up to millions? The total number of animals is fewer than 6,800. The total number of kinds is fewer than 1,400. And again, those are overestimating the numbers. How could he possibly fit all the animals on the ark? Actually, they would fit in just right. We've run the numbers. We've had to go through and figure out how much room they take up, how much water they need, how much food they need. All of those different things have been put into our calculations. And when you put everything together, guess what? They fit just right. It's like Goldilocks. Doesn't that make sense that God would know how big the ark would need to be in order to hold the people and the animals and the food? So I mentioned... Okay. Yeah. I, so that was that was a long bit of nonsense. Yeah. My Wi-Fi cut out for a moment there, PZ. Yeah. Be... Glad to see you made it back in time. You missed all the garbage. <laughs> uh, well, the first thing you see when you go into the ark park, one of the first displays tells you that 99% of all animals, or not animals, organisms ever existed are not extinct. They deny the, one of the very basic things of paleontology. Uh, 
it's really amazing that they underestimate the number of prehistoric organisms that are extinct. Yeah, but they did the arithmetic, he says. Oh, yeah. He said, he yeah. Did. Yeah. I, you know, it's pretty clear that they fudge the numbers so that they'll get the numbers that they wanted. And they're, they're just have to, having to ignore so much data. And, you know, th little things like uh, they, they do this game with the numbers, but then at the beginning of this little segment, he's, he's berating the scientists for having a range of numbers of species from two to eight million which is actually pretty good. That's, that's reflecting how much uncertainty we have. Uh, there have been lots of studies where they go out collecting animals in new places and they find, oh man, there are so many bugs here. <laughs> and so many of them have not been categorized and classified yet. So that's, that's perfectly there's, real. There's definitely a tendency to uh, discount any uncertainty in science. And yes. I notice often on their weekly um, news shows they put out that they will, um, if science comes up with some new information and we change an idea about something, that's, that's bad. When in fact, it's how science works and it's the wonderful part about science that we yeah. change our ideas when new information comes along. And they seem to not understand that. And they criticize that extensively. Yes. And then there's all the wiggle room in his bi biblical interpretation. I mean, some you had just two and some you had 14 and that meant you can just play whatever numbers you want into till until you get something that you think would fit but that was also a lie that 6800 animals would not fit in the ark you know 6800 animals all their food all their their caretakers all this kind of stuff so i actually looked up some zoos and to see what kinds of numbers they've got there and uh, for instance, the uh, let's see, the San Diego Zoo has about 4,000 animals, 800 species, and that requires 100 acres to maintain those. And that's, again, a hugely artificial situation because then they also have to ship in food that's produced in much larger acreage all around the country in order to feed them. Uh, the largest zoo I found, I never heard of the zoo before, but it sounds interesting. Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha. Hmm. Yeah, it's got 17,000 animals there and 962 species. So that's, a, and that requires 130 acres. Uh, it also requires 300 full time and 650 part time workers. <laughs> and the, the ark has eight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the the Ark Park has a petting zoo out back of it. Uh-huh. And they're always trying to get giraffes. They haven't gotten a giraffe yet, which is so relieving to me. But I'm yeah. sure they eventually will try to get a giraffe. But anyway, uh something I proposed when I first reviewed the Ark Park way back in 2016 is that they just move all the animals from the petting zoo into the Ark for a day and turn off the air conditioning and and the and the air filtration good idea. see how things go yeah how, go. how many animals do they have in the petting zoo i never bothered with visiting. not that many they have a few camels a lot of kangaroos a lot of birds um i've heard that it's basically the best part of the ark park now <laughs> but it's still oh. a zoo. but i guarantee you if they put all those animals they do have on there um the stench alone would be um Unbearable. Right. And also the maintenance work. I wonder how many maintenance workers they have taking care of that petting zoo. Yeah, they'd have to they'd have to shovel an awful lot of poop with uh, 6,800 animals in there. Yeah, uh, and of course in the art park they have all these mannequins depicting Noah and his family, his sons, and all of them are spotlessly clean. Not a speck of, of poop on any of them. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the kind of question skeptics actually ask is how did they maintain all these animals for the 150 days or whatever it was that it took to get them there? So they, they don't address that here. They just, oh, it fits. Yeah, we can wedge them all in and that's good enough. So don't worry Tetris about the fact. It's like the video game Tetris. Yeah. You take the sauropod dinosaur and the tyrannosaurus, and then you, you know, put 
giraffe and rearrange them and they all fit. Yes. And, you know, as, as a laboratory person, I, for a long time, I maintained a colony of something like a 200 zebrafish. And that was work. That, that took a lot of effort just to keep them all happy and alive because you got to maintain, you know, you got to monitor temperature, you've got to monitor salinity, you've got to monitor, monitor phosphate and nitrate levels. It's, it's non-trivial <clears throat> to do that. And even now, you know, I've got, I don't work with zebrafish anymore. I work with spiders and I've got about 150 spiders in the lab. And that takes care and time. I, every other day I'm in there feeding the animals just to keep them alive. And then would you believe you also have to clean out spider poop? Hmm. And it's, a, it's a tiny small scale and it's manageable for one guy, but I can't quite imagine a herd of camels and having to work with them. <laughs> well, you just don't have miracles working in your favor, PZ. Oh, that's it. If if only I weren't an atheist and I could pray to God to come down and feed my spiders need, for me. You need to bring in Kenneth Copeland or somebody like that to <laughs> lay game. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Then the other things they, they overlook here is, well, they do make the baby animal excuse that you just bring in baby animals that increases the number you can pack in there. Uh, but again, that also doesn't work because baby animals are a lot of work to take care of. Uh, you know, as a developmental biologist, it's the babies are often more difficult to maintain and grow than the adults. Uh, they also don't, don't talk about the dispersal problem. You've got 6,800 animals. They all land on, on Mount Ararat, wherever that is. And now they've got to get to where they can survive. They, that's, that's kind of a big problem. This is another thing that we would bring up if we we're asking deep questions. Well, that's why they do all the crazy stuff with basically hyper evolution. Yes. Because they claim polar bears didn't exist before the flood. That's one of the uh -huh. signs that have at the ark, and somehow polar bears have evolved in the last uh, forty-three hundred years, according to them. Right. Yes, that, and all those different species just radiated rapidly from that one event, and yet at the same time, at the Creation Museum, they will will talk about how oh, mutations are always deleterious, and you can't possibly tolerate this kind of mutational load, and they'll they'll bring up Walter Romine or whatever and his arguments and say, well, yeah, obviously the mutational load cannot be tolerated. So evolution is false, except yeah. when it's these animals dispersing from Noah's Ark. Yeah. In a bit, they'll have the stuff about the baby dinosaurs on the Ark. Yeah. And the wonderful photograph of Kentucky's attorney general visited the Ark last September. Daniel Cameron. He's running for governor now. And there's a oh. picture of Ken Ham basically um, showing him the sign with the baby dinosaurs. Uh-huh. Which is scary as hell because he could possibly be the next governor of Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, well, you've had a few bad governors there. Well, yeah. We have yeah. a good one, but that's a different matter. Yes, I notice in your background picture, you've got yourself with Ken Ham. Does that mean you're running for governor or Senate from Kentucky <laughs> soon? <laughs> no, I infiltrated a fundraiser back in 2012 and got a lot of their documents uh, about the plan for the ARC. This is before the ARC was built. Uh -huh. And a reporter that came along with me, um, Joe Sonka, he took this picture of um, Ken Ham and myself um, being pals for a moment when he uh -huh. did that. <laughs> you snuck up on him. Yeah, I know Zonka wrote a lot of articles about the about answers in Genesis and their grift. So okay. So yeah, I think this this particular segment, which was so long and so thorough, was built on faulty mathematics and logic and ignored the reality of biology. So that's, that's how we'd answer that. And then it didn't answer any of the questions I would have actually asked him. So let's move on to what's next. What's next coming up here? 
dinosaurs a little bit ago and people think are you crazy dinosaurs on the ark i mean come on really well guys that's not the ark that's a yeah. fairy tale the ark didn't look like that and once you explain that the ark was a lot bigger they think okay i get it the ark was really big but really you think argentinosaurus would go on there i mean they estimate they might have been between 60 and 80 tons well fully grown you don't have to take the biggest ones you take the ones god brings you and why would he bring the biggest ones before they were that size they were this size about the size of a football i'm not saying that noah rolled eggs up the ramp of the ark that's not my point i don't think he did i don't think he had incubators in the ark but after they hatch from there they're not that much bigger how many people built the ark hebrews 11 oh, 7. That's, that's that's address that whole baby animal <laughs> nonsense yeah because like I said, baby animals are a lot of work to care for. They're fragile and <clears throat> they need a lot of assistance. Well, you know, except for the ones that are totally, totally independent, but um, that's not necessarily the case with baby dinosaurs. So uh, it's kind of silly to make that argument. And he didn't have any, he didn't have any incubators on the ark. What? Why didn't they just say there were lots of incubators on the ark? Because they make everything else up. Yeah. Okay, so his next next question that he thinks we ask is how many bu people built it? Oh, this is going to get bad. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Was he the only one swinging the hammer, do you think? That'd be quite a task. But let me ask you this. Did Solomon build the temple? Yes and no, right? Because Solomon probably didn't move any of the blocks into place, but he was in charge of the project. So you can say Solomon built the temple, right? Noah built the ark. It doesn't mean that he was the only one. He's just in charge of the project. Could he have had extended family members helping out? If he's got siblings living nearby, if his dad lived nearby, he died five years before the flood. His grandfather died the year of the flood. If they lived nearby, which we don't know if they did, but they could have helped for a while, correct? What about construction crews? A lot of times people think, no, there's no way he could do construction crews because these people didn't believe. There's no way they would work for him. Well, if there's a paycheck coming in, right? Then many people might be willing to work even if they don't agree with the message. Think about how great this would be for Noah. Noah could be like, you know what? I'll pay you as soon as it stops raining. No, I don't think he did that. Anyways, how many people built the ark? The answer is we just don't know. Wasn't it just a local flood? There are some okay. Oh, we don't know. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he uses that joke a couple of times in this video too. It's It's terrible. But yeah, this, I, I found this uh, personally offensive. This is a horrible segment. So he starts off by saying, uh, Noah didn't build it. He just took credit for it. A whole bunch of people probably helped him build it. And uh, he probably had an extended family. And his extended family could have helped him. And he could have hired construction crews. But then what he kind of does neglects to mention is that after the flood starts, he abandoned all those people to die. So he's he's got all these people he claims could have built this uh, this elaborate, fancy, gigantic ark. Let's and, get them easy. <laughs> yes. Oh yes, that's why that's why Ken Ham is so in favor of capitalism because is because mm -hmm. Noah practiced it, and and I know he mentioned it as a joke that well they could have just hired them and then not paid them after the flood came, but that kind of comes close to the truth, right? So yeah, we paid them the moment before they died. Doesn't help his case very much. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a horrible story. And there were also other horrible stories throughout the museum. I mean, when, and through the art park, there was one video I watched, it was just ghastly. It was a little video they had of this little girl playing in a house and looking out the window and then there's this giant tidal wave looming in on the horizon to completely kill and destroy everything that she knows and did nobody ever stop to question that there's, well, there's... everybody was evil so you, even the little kids and, oh yes um, and it makes them pro-abortion in a way too how some of those people, those women that drowned had to be pregnant Oh, yeah. Okay. So Ken Ham is pro-abortion. There was also a diorama they have there I, where they have all the victims of the flood clinging to rocks and waving desperately at the ark. It's just nightmare oh. city. There's a yeah, there's a great one where um, the guy is pushing his girlfriend off the cliff. He's, he's apparently um, wait, trying to get the ark 
get on the ark, but he's pushing his girlfriend or wife into the water. And then there's yeah. the woman being swallowed whole by the shark in the in the in the same um, mural. Oh, I missed that one. Oh, I'll have to bring that up as my background screen. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should go visit them. No, I'm never going to visit that place no. ever again. But yeah, it's it, it's ghastly stuff. And here he's making jokes and just glossing over the this this catastrophic, you know, mass genocide. But that's fine because they were all evil, right? Okay, so we get uh, oh, we get into the local flood nonsense. How do we know it's not just a local flood? And the answer is going to be because the Bible says so. Christians who have believed the idea that the earth is billions of years old, and they think those rock layers that we see out there are evidence of billions of years. And so they say, well, you can't have a worldwide flood because a worldwide flood would rip up all those layers and lay down new ones. You no longer have the evidence for billions of years. And so they say, well, it must have just been a local, a regional flood, or maybe it was just a worldwide flood that left no evidence. Yeah, you can laugh at that idea. What about this idea of a local flood? Does the Bible allow for that? Here's what we want to do with each of these questions. We want to go back to scripture because that's where we want to start our uh. thinking from. We're going to start from God's word. He's the one who knows everything. He's always been there and he cannot lie. 13 times in the flood account, it tells us that the purpose of the flood was to destroy all flesh. What do you think it means when it's used over and over and over again like that? Everything in whose nostrils was the breath of life that lived on the land was gone. They died. The Bible is very clear on that. That can't happen in a local flood. It only happens with a worldwide flood. The size of the ark tells us this is not a local flood because if it was just a local flood, you only have to bring the animals from that region. Remember, the Bible tells us that the waters covered the highest hills or the highest mountains to the depth of 15 cubits. So that's this measurement times 15, so about 22 feet or so. Once it goes over the top of the highest hills or the highest mountains, guess what it no longer is? No longer local. The duration of the flood tells us this is not a local flood. How long were they in the ark? About a year. We often think of the flood as being 40 days and 40 nights. Well, that was the initial flood mechanism that lasted that long. The waters dominated the earth for about 150. 50 days before they started to go back down. Now, local floods can be devastating and they can last for a while, but they don't last that long. Think about this. If God's just going to flood one region, don't you think he could have said, hey, Noah, I want you to take you and your family and um, just skedaddle out of there for a little while. Let me show you a new place to live. And then once I drown everybody here, you can move back. Well, we can figure that out. Don't you think God could? I think the most important reason for us to believe that this is a worldwide flood, because at the end of it, God puts the rainbow in the sky and says, this is a reminder of my promise to you that I will never again, never again, Never again, three times he says that, destroy the earth with a flood like this. If it was just a local flood, and we have local floods today, then that means every time you see a rainbow, God lied. And yet the Bible tells us it's impossible for God to lie. How about the construction of the... Okay. Oh. Here's the lady getting swallowed whole. Oh, that's cute. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think our audience can see that, but maybe I'll, let, me, let me switch this out so everybody can see that charming thing oh yeah okay uh let's bring that back uh okay yes yeah, so much in there that that's just such nonsense again he's just laughing and having a grand time thinking of this mass genocide so he's just going on and on about this uh so the reason it can't have been a local flood is based entirely on his interpretation of the Bible, which is kind of amusing. Well, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. That's like he started almost every other sentence with that. That's right. And right at the beginning, he says right out that we have to go back to the one true source, the Bible. That's where our evidence comes from. So yeah, that, that was kind of a cop out. Sure, the, the Bible says the water was really, really deep. Therefore, it was a global flood. That's, that's just not a, a legitimate argument. <clears throat> he also makes the point about um, how, how all those skeptics out there were saying that all of this activity must have overturned all these layers and wrecked the planet and you know, produced all these different sedimentation patterns and so forth. But that's his argument. That's what the creationists say. Is you know, if you go back to the Genesis flood, Whitcomb and Morris, that's their argument that all of these major features in geology are the consequence of this cataclysmic flood. So well, why the flood is so complex it can do anything according to them. I mean, oh, it makes right. 
like uh, terrestrial environments when they really formed in water and just all these yeah you know geology is interpretations but geology usually puts forth very good interpretations and they're based on evidence not on what what we wish to believe or what the bible says or, yeah. and and they're also consistent with each other that's the whole point of doing the science is you try to get a, get explanations that line up multiple observations and produce a coherent explanation of what happened uh that's not the case here yeah okay shall we dig into the construction of the ark this this whole section where he's talking about various details of the construction of the ark i just felt like who cares <laughs> all he's got is is one short chapter in the bible that describes in very general terms this ark yet somehow we're supposed to take this as a detailed blueprint of how it was done and i just don't i don't care Ark. I used to get this question quite a bit. No, the Bible does not say it with a box. The Hebrew word is teva. It only appears outside of the flood account in one place. That's at Exodus chapter 2. Anybody know what's happening in Exodus 2, why it uses that word? There was a little baby named Moses who was placed into an ark of bulrushes. Did that have to be a box? No, you see, most of the time the words don't tell you the shape of something. Many times they tell you the function, the purpose of something. And in both these cases, Noah's huge ark and Moses' little ark, what was the purpose? To save, preserve, protect life, right? Life preserver. And that's really what this word is describing. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Most likely it's an Egyptian loan word, which makes sense. Moses is writing this. Moses grew up where? Egypt. But it's from their word for sarcophagus. That's pretty weird, isn't it? Because sarcophagus is where you put dead bodies. This doesn't seem like life preserving, except in Egyptian theology, what do they think they were doing? Preserving them for the afterlife. So now it does make sense, doesn't it? So it's telling us the dimensions. The Bible gives the dimensions. It doesn't tell us the shape. If I told you I'm six foot eight inches tall, that means at the very top of my head, that's how tall I am. I know some of you are like, you're not that tall and you'll come up afterwards. I am, okay? It doesn't mean I'm a rectangle. It just means at the very top of my head. When you give the dimensions of something, you're just giving the longest measurement. You're not saying it's a, a cube. If you give the dimensions of a car, you're just giving the longest dimension each direction. And that's what's happening here with the arc. Okay. Uh, uh, this, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a classic example of something that we don't care about. That, you know, arc and flood skeptics aren't sitting around saying, well, the ark was a box, yet the evidence over here shows that it was boat shaped. No, we're, we're not doing that. We just don't care. This is, this is not evidence of anything. You, you can't refute the skeptics by saying the ark was actually looking like this thing that we created in Kentucky, because that's just not one of our concerns. And of course, we, of course, they make it look like an oil tanker with the um, really weird prow. But, you know, this is all fan fiction. I mean, that's the sad thing about it. And notice in this segment, they started adding this weird pseudo Middle Eastern sounding music. Oh, yeah, the, if, the flutes and all that stuff going on. Yeah, the I mean, I don't understand why they did. Well, I think I'm, I might have a reason they could have done this is that you notice they start talking quicker and louder and playing more background music, the more stupid the stuff being discussed is and that might be a sales point a way of a psychological way of reaching their audiences not to get them to think too much have a lot of background music and quick talk it's a distraction stop paying attention to the nonsense the idiot is staying on, saying on stage and, and get puzzled over what is this weird music that's going on that's that's all they're doing yeah yeah, so this is, like I said, this is this is one of those segments where I just felt like saying, we don't care. This is not evidence for or against the ARC. It's just totally irrelevant. Why are you treating this as a serious question? Okay, what does he do next? So it doesn't mean that it was box shaped. What is gopher wood? People would say, hey, are you guys building the ark out of the same thing that Noah built his ark out of? And I'd say, yep, wood. No, 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 are you building it out of gopher wood? And the answer is, um, I don't know, what's gopher wood? We aren't 100% sure what that is because it's only used one time in the Bible, Genesis 6, 14, make an ark of gopher wood. So we're not entirely sure what it is, what kind of trees came from that. Some Bibles will say that it was cypress, but here's what they're doing. And this is, this is really a mistake because they're saying, look at the Middle East today. What kind of lumber or 
we're kind of trees are there that could be used to build a big boat. Well, did he build the Ark in the Middle East? Was there a Middle East? Just because it landed in that region after the flood doesn't mean that's where it started. The world was very different. It's not like they just went up and anchored and just stayed in the same spot the whole time. They would get carried along by the wind and the waves. So we don't know where they were when they built it. So ultimately, what is gopher wood? The answer is we just don't know. Uh, all right. See, I told you. There cool. he's doing it again. <laughs> Yeah, but again, uh, has does anyone really care what wood was used to make the boat? <laughs> I maybe it's a rodent with an erection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, and it doesn't matter. I, I, I really don't care. Uh, they could say it was made of cypress; it wouldn't make any difference to me. It's just um, totally irrelevant to their point. Magic. It's it's a magic wood. You know. Yeah. It's it's made out of shiplap. That's that's the answer. And because I don't know what shiplap is made out of either. So it does but again uh, maybe it's it's made it's made out of dilithium crystals. Oh, that would be a good one. Yeah, who knows what the flotation and strength pro abilities of dilithium are. So yeah. And the Hebrews just didn't have a word for dilithium. Gopher was their best translation. <laughs> yeah, but again, he spends, he spends what, 50 seconds on this. And it's, I just don't care at all. That's a lot of this, I feel like just saying, yeah, why are you, why are you telling me this as a serious question that needs to be answered? Because it's not, we just don't care. Okay, so he got... Go for wood, and now he's going to he's going to plunge into another set of details, all Bible based, that we don't care about. So how about this? And how long did it take to build the ark? A lot of people think 120 years. That comes from this verse in Genesis 6: 3. The Lord said, "My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years." And people think, see, there's a countdown to the flood. And even if that's the right way to interpret that verse, other people think that maybe this verse should be interpreted as like a shortening of man's lifespan from over 900 years down to the 120. Whichever way you take that verse, nothing here says that Noah started building the ark at this point. In fact, the ark isn't mentioned for like another 11 verses. So 120 years doesn't seem to be the right answer. How about 100 years? Because in Genesis 5.32, we were told that Noah was 500 years old when he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Doesn't mean they were triplets, just the oldest was born at that time. But the flood came when he was 600. There's a 100 year difference right there. So that's how long he had to build it. Except when God told him to build the ark, he said it's gonna be for you, your wife, your sons and your son's wives with you. Sounds like the boys are already grown up and married when God said build the ark, doesn't it? Which would mean what? Well, it's gonna be less than a hundred years. How long would it take for the three boys to be born to grow up and then get married? Maybe 25 to 50 years? So subtract that from the hundred and you have a maximum build time of 50 to 75 years. Now, I don't know if it took that long. I'm saying that's about the maximum that we can get from scripture. So how did Noah find all the animals? Okay, before we get into this, let's, let's address that bit of nonsense because Again, it, it's a I don't care issue, right? Do we care how long it took them to build this this boat? Okay, uh, sure, 50 years. Go ahead, say 50 years. The Bible doesn't say that. This is a matter of interpretation, but it it just doesn't matter. Yeah, more fan, more fan fiction and it. Yeah. The magical gopher wood, I guess it didn't rot while it was being built. You know, if you have finish one section of the ark and work on another section, the, if it's hundreds of years, doesn't the wood start to rot in the first section you worked on? Of course, a miracle occurs and gopher wood is magic. So, of course, it doesn't mean jack. Yeah. And of course, Noah was what, 500 years old when he starts building this thing. Right. Yeah. Again, it's just another fictional story that they're telling us and none of that is evidence for the actual reality of the ark and that's the question that's in our heads as skeptics is did this thing really exist and telling me oh well the bible says no it took 50 years to build it doesn't address the question it's just silly okay so now we get into another silly question. How did Noah find the animals? All right. Skeptics love this one. Do you really think that Noah had to go to Australia and find the kangaroos and the koalas and he got back and he's like, oh guys, we forgot the wombats. Is that really the picture that the Bible gives us? No, remember we said we think that the world is very different. There was no Australia at the time. If we start from the Bible, we have the answer to this question. Genesis 6:20. a bird's after their kind, of animals after their kind, two of every kind will come 
to you. He didn't have to go look for the animals. And yet, how many times have we heard that? Always take it back to God's word. Let's talk about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> take it back to God's word. Sure. But that's, that's the point. We don't believe that the Bible is God's word. But this well, is. Of course, it's, it's so interesting that so many of the animals have their fossil record in the very places like the all the different marsupials in Australia that have their fossil record of kangaroos and wombats and all these other really cool um, Pleistocene megafauna type things are in Australia, but yet um, they somehow went to the Middle East and then came back to where their fossil relatives are. I right. Mean, it's, just, it, it's just, it just doesn't make a bit of sense and it's made up. I mean, that's, that's the only thing you can say about it. It's made up. And geography doesn't matter. Biogeography yeah. doesn't matter because a miracle happens and God just tells them all to go on a walk from Kamchatka or Iowa or wherever and get to the middle East or where, wherever the ark is and get on board. And there's some organisms that can't really um, go any length of distance in an unbelievable amount of time. I mean, there's like, uh, there's a giant earthworm that lives in Australia. I forgot the name of it. Your biologist, you probably... I don't, I don't but, recall. But anyway, it. how the hell did that make it all the way to wherever the ark was, and then all the way back to Australia? Well, it had 50 years to get there while Noah was building the ark, right? Yeah. yeah. An earthworm. And, yeah. Yeah. And sloths. They had plenty of time to get there. Or God just transported them. I don't know. You can... They rode on they rode on pterodactyls. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, God encouraged collaboration among the animals, so they all got there. Uh-huh. Well, also ground, ground sloths clinging to it. <laughs> yeah. Also, I noticed they kind of left it open where the Ark was located. It doesn't have to be the Middle East, he says. Maybe it was Kentucky. <laughs> well, don't the Mormons have the Garden of Eden somewhere in, um, is it Illinois? or Yeah, uh, yeah Nauvoo, Illinois is somewhere near where the Garden of Eden was located. So sure, that might be an added plus as a tourist attraction to say, this is actually where it was built. Wouldn't put it past him to try that. Okay, so the next part I thought was just ironic and amusing. So what he's showing up here on the screen, I'll just point you to the bottom right corner. This is an illustration from Answers in Genesis. So keep that in mind when he tells you what it's it a means. misconception that people have about the ark and about the flood. And there's one right there, actually, on the screen. That is not Noah's ark. That is a fairy tale. That is a bathtub ark. I get that it's really cute. I mean, it's adorable. But let me ask you this. Is that what the flood account is about in scripture? A happy old guy and a bunch of cute animals? Or is it about an extremely wicked world that had turned its back on God and was filled with violence and corruption throughout the whole world to the, to the degree that God was grieved that he had made man and he was going to wipe man out and yet he showed his grace and mercy to Noah and his family. If this is the only message we ever convey to people and we teach young people from when they're really little all the way up that this is what Noah's Ark is about and then they get to high school and they have this picture still in their mind and skeptics start approaching them, it's a fairy tale, right? That's what's in their head. Several years ago, Bill... Okay. Yes, it's a fairy tale. That's the one honest thing that he has said this entire video. I would agree with him that it's it's a fairy tale. It's kind of interesting, though, that what he is arguing is that we need to inculcate this really horrible image of a world full of sin and evil and a vengeful God destroying everything. Uh, yeah, that's that's going to bring people to Jesus, right? Yeah, there's an entire room at the Ark devoted to fairy tale arcs. Uh -huh. It has all these kids' books that show cute Noah's arcs on them. And it's all brightly lit, unlike most of the art park. It has all these animal sculptures. And kids probably come in thinking it's going to be a really wonderful, fun thing. And the display is all about how um, fairy tale uh, bathtub-shaped arcs 
destroy people's faith in the book of Genesis. And they instead need to learn how all these rotten corpses were floating on the water and all this mass death and destruction was caused by the flood. Um, exactly. Yeah. They actually rail against all these kids' books. And it's, it's really amusing in a way, but I feel sorry for all the kids that go in thinking they're going to see something fun and they find all this boring discussion of rotting corpses and uh the horrors of the art well they're not getting the true people. picture of christianity christianity is a death cult and we got to start them at a young age recognizing that yeah it's kind of a horrible story uh the the bathtub arcs are kind of cute but oh yeah they're they're kind of everywhere but hmm. Okay, what do we got coming up next year? I, guy that plays a science guy on TV, stood right here on the stage and did a debate with our CEO, Ken Ham. And he said during the debate that his ancestors were shipbuilders in New England. And he said during that time when these large wooden ships were being constructed, he said the biggest one they were ever able to build was the Wyoming. It was a six-masted schooner, and the problem was it was 430 feet long from tip to tip. So it's not quite as big as the Ark, but it's getting closer, right? And he said the problem was that it would keep springing holes, and it would twist and bend, and, and water kept coming in, and they'd have to keep trying to bail it out. And then it sank, and all 14 people on board were killed. And those things are true. But you know what? He left out a really, really important detail. And I want you to decide whether it was accidental or not. The Wyoming floated and carried thousands of tons of coal up and down the coast for over 14 years. Why do you think he didn't mention that at all? Some people say the Bible copied from ancient flood myths. In fact, we find flood legends from all over the globe. I know because I've read over 200 of them for while I was preparing for this exhibit in the Ark, the flood legends exhibit. Oh, let's, let's get back to the big boat. Because that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I looked it up, you know, and boy, the Wyoming was a beautiful ship. Yeah, go look it up. It's it's just gorgeous. This big old uh, schooner that was built in Maine way back when, and uh, 1909, I guess it was. But there are a couple things that he leaves out of the story. Uh, one is that it required constant pumping and bailing because it was constantly leaking because of its length and all of its twisting and turning and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's in some ways it was a little bit unpractical, but they did make good money out of it. Uh, the other thing is that what the ship did was haul coal, just coal, not a whole zoo full of animals, which would have been much more difficult. And also you can even see in that picture, if you look at the, you know, if you compare the Wyoming to the Ark, uh, it was significantly smaller than the Ark that they've created because it was slim and built for sailing. And the Ark is just a great big barge. So that's another problem. And then also uh, what happened to the Wyoming? It sank in a storm. Yeah, it just, it just split in two in a storm and, and sank. And you've got Noah's Ark which is sailing out into this gigantic ocean uh, that was, you know, this tremendous cataclysmic storm. Oh, I see a question on the chat. How many crew on the Wyoming? I think it was like 15, 15 or 16. So, yeah. But then again, they didn't have to tend to any animals. Yeah. yeah. Well, you wonder because they make all these claims that before the flood, um, people were super intelligent and were able of all these different technologies. Why didn't Noah, instead of using gopher wood, make it out of metal? Sure. I mean, if you're going to fantasize, let's have a metal arc and have gopher wood being a special type of metal or something. Or steel and fiberglass. Yeah. Uh, there's. Yeah, th you know, that's an, another point here. We're talking about a boat being built. 4,000 years ago, and if you look at the anthropological, archaeological record, what do you find 4,000 years ago? You find reed boats, you find coracles, you find, you know, fairly simple things. Uh, even the Polynesian sail sailors weren't building advanced boats then, but they were going to build some pretty sophisticated ships. So why would you think that suddenly this guy uh, building Noah's Ark has 
advanced shipbuilding techniques. Where did they come from? Yeah. So it's all pretty silly stuff. In the chat, the ark was made from unobtainium and prayer. Oh, yeah, that might have worked. <laughs> it floated in the sky. Yeah, why not a flying ark? That would have been a spaceship ark, so I could just soar right above all the storms and, and death and disaster. Ooh, a steampunk ark, ark with a uh, big <laughs> zeppelin above it carrying it. There you go. You know, the Bible doesn't say it wasn't. Therefore, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to get to the old flood myths. Yeah, here we go. This is every place where you see the little dots on the map, and there's a lot more than just that. There's flood legends, and a lot of times they sound very similar to the biblical account. Now there's some differences, but a lot of times it's about one righteous man or a favored family who was told by God or by the gods that the, there's going to be a big flood that destroyed everything. So build a boat, build a raft, build a canoe, build an ark, and bring the animals on board. And then the flood's going to come, and then you can start over. And sometimes there's even a rainbow mentioned at the end. Sometimes there's even animals that are sent off to check the water depth and everything at the end. So there are a lot of similarities around the globe. Now people will. Say Say, well, the Bible just copied these ancient, ancient myths, but that's not the case. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 11 that the whole world was one tongue, one speech, one language, and then God had told them to scatter, be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. They didn't. They gathered together in the plain of Shinar, and then God came down and confused their language, and they scattered throughout the globe. They took their beliefs, they took their history with them, and as the years went by, they started sharing that history, but it gets distorted over time, and there's still that kernel of truth. The Bible gives us the real account of what happened. These ones are echoes of that. Here's one that's a possible misconception. A lot of people are Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's let's deal with that one. So uh the only flood their legend. version is right. Nobody else's yes. version is right, only theirs. <laughs> yes, and they got that that map of where, where all these flood myths are. Uh where do people have floods? Everywhere. Floods have always because people settled near, you know, in river valleys and so forth, and there's all kinds of floods that are that are cataclysmic as far as the local population is concerned. So why would we think that finding a flood myth in a city on a floodplain is somehow mysterious or must have been traced back to the Bible? They, they didn't read the Bibles. So they wouldn't know. So it's, it's just a bogus argument that they're making. It, it's all they all they've got is to claim that the Bible is preeminent over all other myths, and therefore, all the other myths are reflections of it. Those other yeah. people had myths, and they were savages, according to AIG. They were just right. dumb. They were dumbasses, and AIG has it right. That's right. They were all primitives because they weren't able to build a boat with a dirigible hauling it around the world like Noah could. Okay, so that you know that I've heard the flood myth before, and all it says is that there's a kind of a universal common human experience with floods and disasters, and lots of people make up stories about them. That's all it tells us. Heard that it never rained before the flood, and they get that from Gen Wait a minute, did you ever hear that it never rained before the flood? I've only heard Carl Boss say that he was the creationist down in Texas, but he's even a crackpot by creationist. Now. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, again, we're going to get an answer to a non-existent question. Chapter 2, verse 5, Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. The problem with that, this verse is describing the circumstances on day 6 before God makes man. Does that mean that we can extrapolate from that point in history to well over a thousand years later and say it never rained on the earth? I don't really think that you can. I don't think that's the point of this verse. It's just setting up for what's about to happen. So that's why I say yeah, so that uh, why do you bring it up? I want to ask him. This is this is not something anyone has worried about. This is not this is not evidence against Noah's Ark to say, oh well, it didn't rain before, because nobody thinks that. Uh, but this is this is the kind of thing we have to deal with. 
Okay, now we get into rainbows. Oh, this is going to be fun. It's a possible misconception. Does the Bible ever say there were no rainbows before the flood? It doesn't. Now, God put the rainbow in the sky afterwards, but that doesn't mean that's the first rainbow that ever happened. When God said in Exodus chapter 12 to take a lamb without blemish and to sacrifice that for the Passover, did he invent lambs at that point? Or did they just suddenly take on a new significance? So he doesn't have to create something in order to use that as a symbol or a sign. He can take something that's already there. Let me ask you this. If you were in the pre-flood world and there was a waterfall and you got the mist coming off of there and sunlight shines through it, what do you think you would see? I bet you see the colors of the spectrum. Now, could God have changed the laws of physics at that? I'm sure, but I don't think that he did. But there doesn't seem to be a reason that he would have done that. So how many of you have heard? Okay, so somehow the rainbow is simultaneously a unique magical symbol of God's mercy and uh, something that just arises by physics. <laughs> Well, Ken Ham lights up the. I have it in my background screen, if you can show people. Okay. Um, Ken Ham lights up the ark as a rainbow because he wants to take the rainbow back from the gays. <laughs> he really they they have shirts that say something taking back the rainbow on them that you can buy in their gift store. Yeah. And yeah. Anyway, but here's how they light up the ark sometimes at night. You can barely see it from the interstate if you turn your head the right direction <laughs> yeah but this is what i mean by it being just you know kind of kind of a set of bogus excuses why should we think this okay oh here's my mm, i have suddenly lost my video give me a second i'll find it oh there it is okay yeah so it's it's kind of a pointless argument and and if you know the bible says that god put the rainbow in the sky as a symbol of his mercy so he didn't it was there all along just like the rain was there all along okay whoop de do okay what do we got next coming up here uh, we're almost to the end we're getting there so uh, and here comes another question that we did not care about and nobody has asked. Noah was an amateur. The Titanic was built by experts. The Ark was built by an amateur. So what if Noah was already one of the best shipbuilders in the world? Have you considered that before? It's a different view than what we usually think of him. The Bible never says he was an amateur. It doesn't say he was an expert either, but he was able to do what God called him to do. So certainly by the time he got around to building it, he knew what he was doing, or he could hire people who knew what they were doing. Does the Bible say... The okay, so, so what? <laughs> well again at the ark they have all these displays giving a made-up back history for noah and he probably will discuss this i think in another moment or two yeah um, but it's all made up stuff and if anybody uh, i think it was like 2010 or so there was a movie with russell crowe about noah uh-huh ken ham raised holy shit fire hell about that movie because it made up all this stuff that wasn't in the Bible. Well, Ken Ham in 2016 opens the ark and he has all this made up stuff about Noah being the a shipbuilder with a desire for adventure that married the ship um, yard uh, owner's daughter and all these just yeah even by their own standards just total crazy made up stuff. Yes, and there, I, I also recall there's an animatronic display of, uh, of Noah and a couple of his buddies building, you know, hammering away at lumber and all this stuff. And it's got Noah speaking. And of course, he speaks with this thick New York Jewish accent. Yeah, it's more Yiddish. Yeah, I know what yes. the one yeah. Boy, Noah, I got a <laughs> splinter in my finger. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know where that accent came from. It's just it's just <laughs> Ken Ham playing with people's biases, I guess, because uh, that was that was just it was just jarring when you get to that and you hear this, the, you know, these these stereotypes up there. Okay, so now we're going to get to these other questions. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, so he could have been an expert, but he might not have been. It doesn't say. It's just, ugh. We'll, we'll make up what we want. 
flood only lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, that was the initial flood mechanism. The fountains of the great deep bursting open and the windows of heaven. But the waters continued to dominate the earth for 150 days before they started to go down. And again, they were in the ark for about a year. And does the Bible ever say that Noah was mocked while he was preaching? Okay, just about, let's deal with that real quick. Again, who cares? I, I was a Christian once upon a time. I read the Bible. I knew that it was rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And then it was about a year before they came to came to ground. It, it doesn't make any difference. It's just something the Bible said. There's no evidence of this colossal storm. There's no evidence of the recession of the waters. There's no evidence of the ark. So this point does not mean anything. And that, that he was pleading with people to go on board the ark. It doesn't say that either. In fact, you won't find a single verse in the Bible that talks about people making fun of Noah. Our brains fill in details that we think are there. And we heard it when we were in Sunday school. And then we kind of just repeat it without ever realizing the Bible never says it. Noah lived in a very ungodly world. And he was a very righteous man. Do you think they made fun of him? Probably. If there were people around, that's very believable. I have no problem believing that they did. What I want you to see is that the Bible doesn't say that they did. See that it's Okay, the Bible doesn't say that. So who cares? Yeah. Does does anybody's criticism of Noah's Ark rely on the fact that Noah was mocked? I don't think so. It's just it's just more of this storytelling that they're doing. Let's talk real quickly about Noah's family. The Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of information about them. The Bible doesn't tell us really anything about her other than she was married to Noah, she survived the flood, and she had three sons. Do you think it's safe to assume that she was faithful? I think that's a pretty safe assumption. It's hard to imagine assumption. Noah doing all of the things that God commanded him to do if she was not there supporting him. She's unnamed in Scripture. That hasn't stopped some people from trying to name her. One of the most common names people give her today is the name Naama, and that comes from Genesis 4.22. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. And people say, well, it doesn't say anything about her, so maybe she's named because she's Noah's wife. Maybe. I mean, it doesn't tell us that at all, so it's really just a guess. Another name that she was called in the past was the name Emsara, and that really just means like ancestor of Sarah, so people would connect Noah to Abraham, so they connect Noah's wife to Abraham's wife. So she's called that in the book of Jubilees, which was written in the second century BC. It's called Little Genesis because it takes little bits of Genesis and then kind of expand the story. It's kind of like historical fiction. It's not inspired by God. It's not part of scripture. But here's what it says. Noah took to himself a wife, and her name was Emsara. Let's wrap it up by talking about who Noah was. Okay, before we get to that, let's talk about Noah's wife. I think he was wrong. I think I think Noah's wife was actually named Wilma. <laughs> and and we know things about Wilma that she was she was redhead and she had a best friend named Betty. That's about go. as that's about as accurate as the kind of stuff that they're making up here. Yeah, PZ, there there's a wonderful scene in the documentary we believe in dinosaurs where patrick marsh the designer of the ark who is now deceased probably due to covid and some other guy that's one of the designers are going through all these photographs of women and trying to come up with the ideal uh, women from the middle east to represent noah's sons or noah's son's wives and uh -huh. it's really creepy these guys are almost um eroticized by these airbrushed pictures of women that are vaguely middle eastern vaguely olive skin vaguely white and just it's a really bizarre scene that ends up being really um creepy i mean for lack of yeah. a better word it's really creepy these guys are lusting over these photographs of these imaginary women that they want to have as noah's son's wives right they make up names for every single one of these women, even though even all the scriptural bullshit doesn't contain names for any of these women. Yeah. Yeah. And if they're doing the same thing here on screen, that, the, that yeah. picture of Noah, it's somebody who's, who, who would look vaguely European. That's what they care about. And I uh, just give them a slightly darker complexion. Sure. And Otherwise, we're just going to pretend that this is this is one of our ancestors, we European colonizers, and uh, that's who it is. So yeah, it's it's again making stuff up and claiming biblical authority for it. It just doesn't and, work. And I think it's really interesting, and it tells a lot about the people that wrote the Bible originally that they, the women were so insignificant. 
but they really aren't named at all. That's right. It's, the guy, it's only the guys that are important. The women don't mean crap to them. That's right. They're baby, they're baby makers. That's it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, who was Noah? You can read about the historical account of the flood, the ark, and Noah in Genesis 5 through 9. You can read details about his character in Ezekiel 14 and Hebrews 11. And the Ezekiel 14, when I always get a kick out of this, God is describing the wickedness in Jerusalem. He's saying you're going to judge them. They're going to be wiped out. And that's not the part I get a kick out of. But he says, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would save only themselves by their righteousness. Noah is put in the same category as Job and Daniel. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know what's even cooler? Ezekiel wrote that, meaning that Daniel was alive when that happened. So he put Daniel in the same category as Job and Noah. That should tell you something about Daniel's character. And you can read details about the time in which he lived in Matthew, Luke, and 2 Peter. We know he was a righteous man. The Bible says uh, that God said to him, come into the ark, you and your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. He was a hard-working man. God told him to make the ark of Gopher when he goes through and says, here's how you're going to make it, and all these different things. And Noah did all of those things. He was a blessed man. God blessed Noah and his son and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He was a husband and a father, as we've talked about. God said he's going to establish his covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. He was a faithful man. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. And finally, Genesis 6, 22, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Wouldn't that be a wonderful testimony for each one of us, if you could put your own name in place of Noah's? We know that Noah... Okay, so, <laughs> oh man, Noah was so good, and the Bible tells us that he was so good, so therefore he must have been good. Yeah, and yeah. John Luke Picard was much better than James Tiberius Kirk. He didn't sleep with any green-skinned alien women. There you go, yeah. <laughs> you got to trust those Star Trek scripts. They were, they're truth, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I understand that uh, Fred Flintstone was a hardworking blue collar man who provided for his family and his child. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's that's that settles it. Hey, Flintstone. hey, Fred Flintstone had a uh, the Flintstones had a Christmas episode. Explain that. Oh, he was a prophet as well. Okay, but this is this is kind of emblematic of what this whole video does is it's just making stuff up based on fragmentary stuff in the bible and you know i i don't care what ezekiel said about noah because ezekiel if he was real at all was not a contemporary of noah and didn't know him so what value is that kind of judgment you know that we get the same thing in the hagiography of um, founding fathers of the United States. They were all saints and wonderful people who thought only of the people and never mind that a bunch of them were slave owners. And rapers. And slave rapers. rapers. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, you just don't find, you know, in, in this kind of document like the Bible, which is all about praising the heroes of the Bible. You don't find them bringing up the reality of how awful they were. So, yeah. Okay, so that, that was the last of the real stuff. Then the next section, I maybe we can stop here because the next the rest of it is why does the ark matter? And it's all Jesus crap. It's all, oh, Noah was, you know, the ark was the door and Jesus is the door and he was and guarding. The the, was the door. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's... It's it's all these this Christian metaphor stuff, and I I don't feel like going through it because the rest of it was pretty revolting as it was. So uh, let me just quickly let's browse through the chat. Does anybody have any comments they want to make here? I brought up a few of them as we went along. Went along. Uh, so yeah, we got lots of questions, but they're all they're all about how ridiculous this was. Okay, uh, we got one mentioned. The Chinese legend looks nothing like the story of Noah. Oh, but I remember way back when everyone was saying, well, the Chinese characters for the, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, they look like an ark or something. So it was clearly the same thing. And uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, there was somebody that had an entire ministry where they would go around with Chinese characters. I think they were Chinese in origin. And yeah. They they went around the churches 
showing all these Chinese characters and saying that they represented Noah's Ark and right, and yeah, crap. oh crap, but that's a different matter. Yeah, that when I first came to Minnesota, uh, came to the university here, there was one of these itinerant preachers who came around, and he was trotting out the whole nonsense about the Chinese characters as well. So, yeah, it kind of it kind of spread around in the early two thousands all over the place. Oh, here's a good question for Dr. Phelps. Uh, I don't have a doctor. I don't I only have a master's degree. Okay, for Master Phelps. <laughs> he's asking, share his thoughts on how the Coconino sandstone and other Aeolian deposits may or may not refute the idea of Noah's, Noah's flood. All right. I well, those answer. are you know, those are Permian Age um, sandstones found out in the American West, mainly in the northern Arizona. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have um, large crossbred, cross, ooh, cross beds and uh, frosted, very well-rounded quartz grains. And almost any geologist that would look at this would say, hey, this is a ancient dune deposit called a Olean deposit. Uh, there's a creationist up at uh, Cedarville University up in central Ohio that keeps publishing abstracts at GSA meetings, trying to claim it formed underwater. But there's all sorts of, I mean, nobody takes this guy seriously, but he, at least to his credit, he tries to publish stuff at poster sessions of GSA, Geological Society of America. Yeah. But the unit is um, got footprints in it, and they try to claim the footprints were made underwater. I mean, there's all these ad hoc explanations the creationists use to try to deal with this. And that's, that's a big thing with creationists. They like to do uh, ad hoc explanations. In mm -hmm. science, occasionally you can posit an ad hoc explanation for something that doesn't fit your theory because you don't have enough evidence yet. I mean, there's famous examples. Um, I think Einstein added the cosmological constant and stuff like that. But overall, if you see a person positing ad hoc explanation after ad hoc explanation, it's almost certainly going to be pseudoscience that they're promoting. It, it's like turtles all the way down. You know, the old joke about the woman that comes up to the astronomer says she has a better theory about the universe and she claims the earth is resting on the back of different turtles. And eventually the astronomer, instead of just saying you're full of shit, says, well, what does this turtle rest on? And then what does this turtle rest on? And she basically says, well, sir, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> and it's just ad hoc. You keep positing things that you don't have any evidence for as an ad hoc explanation. And that's yeah. how the creationists deal with a lot of evidence for ancient geological units that formed in terrestrial environments or aeolian environments, tidal flats that have mud cracks. They'll try to claim the mud cracks aren't mud cracks. And um, there's just all these ad hoc explanations for the very complex geologic record that shows things forming in land, on lakes, in sand, in sand dunes, all these different environments that don't fit with the Noah's flood claim. Mm -hmm. And the creationist will come up with ad hoc explanations and they'll actually have people with degrees that will go out of their way to uh, come up with explanations of why the traditional um, interpretation of these environments is wrong. But they haven't gotten any ground in the actual geologic community. They're, yeah. they're considered uh, cranks, but Again, to their credit, at least they do what scientists are supposed to do, even if they're not doing it very well. They're going to scientific meetings and putting up posters and putting up abstracts. And that's about right. all you can give them, nothing else. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a geologist, but I lived in Utah for a while. And I just recall that there were these spectacular Aeolian deposits that you look at them and they look like sand dunes and swirling features that it looks to my untrained eyes it really is much more convin convincing to say that those are windblown yeah the navajo sandstone if you go to like zion national park in yep. utah there's a wonderful place in the in the near the entrance of the park called um, the checkerboard and this is enormous outcrop 
uh, that you can see all these uh, cross beddings and basically, um, even though the word fossilized isn't really correct, but you can say they're fossilized sand dunes. Uh huh. Okay, we got a follow up here on that. Yes, one more thing. Some creationists claim that the continental slope sediments are evidence of flood runoff. Does that make sense to you? That, but that doesn't really mean there's any reality <laughs> to it. So, <laughs> um, creationists claim a lot of things. They have their own literature that is just so bizarre that uh, most paleontologists, well, most, most geologists and paleontologists aren't even aware of the um, existence of most of their papers because they're not publishing in referee journals. They have their own in-house journal, like um, the thing put out by the Creation Research Society. Yeah. That is actually, if you go to the library and try to find it, it's in the theology section because that's how the publishers of the journal actually list the journal. Mm -hmm. And of course, Answers in Genesis has their own thing called Answers Research Journal that is edited by Andrew, Andrew Snelling, the guy they have there that has a doctorate in geology. And if you look at the description of the requirements for papers submitted to the journal, it has to agree with biblical literalism. Uh -huh. They won't put anything that disagrees with biblical literalism. So they have all these papers they put together on not only geology, but biology and paleo that they are like parodies of scientific journal articles. Uh, they have the same format, but then you start looking at them in detail and it's all stuff about, well, the Bible says this and scripture says that. Um, we don't believe this because it disagrees with the Noah's flood explanation. You know, it's just they know that they, they know the findings before they start doing their study. Yeah. And you can't do that. I mean, you might, you still have to support your ideas, even if you think you can have thought of your conclusion first. You still have to have lots and lots of good evidence. Right. All of things written in science have to be evidence based. And that's something that you just want to scream and call them knuckleheads sometimes because they won't accept this. Things have to be evidence based. No, and no, they're supposed to be Bible based. Didn't you hear well, these guys talking? <laughs> well, Bible, Bible, the Bible based stuff trumps the evidence based stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should mention they also sometimes get in legitimate journals. I mean, uh, there are some journals that are committed to publishing just all kinds of different points of view. I know eLife, for instance, did that, and they get they get occasionally really absurd papers published in there oh so yeah it does happen yeah and there's lots of predatory journals that are hilarious oh. there's one there's one i posted recently about the pan on the pandas thumb website this guy had paid to publish and his article was claiming that humans were descended from dinosaurs and he had all these just weathered pieces of igneous and metamorphic rock from somewhere in europe this guy was French, and he was claiming these were dinosaur skulls and early hominid skulls and stuff like that. And it was just pareidolia. He yep. was, they weren't even fossils. They were sometimes igneous rocks that he was claiming were dinosaur skulls. But this journal published it. But he had to pay probably several hundred dollars, but it, they still published it. Yeah, that's... And, and the thing is, too, that when they do publish it in legitimate journals, they get so much crushing response to their stuff. So I, I can't get too upset about it, but they, they do get destroyed yeah. by every legitimate science because they do such a bad job of it. Yeah. And of course, yeah. creationists always have the option when they see a scientific paper they disagree with, they could write up a rebuttal, you know, uh, just basically write a paper saying, well, so-and-so is wrong on this point, and they never do that. I have never yeah. seen a creationist write a um, response to a scientific article and submit it to the actual journal it was published in. Because even those responses require some evidence. Yeah. Yeah, so th it's kind of hard for them to do. Uh, let's see. Try. My point is they don't even try. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other, oh, what era is your background from? Oh, that's a nice Ordovician scene. Uh -huh. uh, I was painting 
by an artist affiliated with the Cincinnati Museum Center. And I think the Cincinnati Museum Center sells like coffee cup, cups and mugs and all sorts of stuff showing these not only cephalopods uh, eating trilobites and all these other, um, There's, I think there's a crinoid in the picture somewhere there. Uh-huh. Uh, so so go to Cincinnati Museum Center. You can probably find the original piece of art that I'm okay. I will I'll get in the car right now. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've just got I've just got spiders on my cups. Yeah. So. <laughs> Years back when you were cephalopods, I had a friend of mine uh give you a bunch of cephalopod fossils when you went to the creation museum. I still have them. I've got them in a shelf right over here. So yeah, <laughs> I keep them. great. If you ever need anything else, let me know. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I teach an introductory biology course, and sometimes I will br bring in these fossils to show them that, hey, yeah, that people actually do these things. I've also got some, tri not very good, but, they're, but I dug them myself. I have some trilobite fossils around here that I also bring in that are, are nice to show off. Well, let me okay. know thing like that i'll try to oblige you with a teaching specimen oh very good yeah well i should i should come out to kentucky sometime and we oh, should please, please. team up nope. and just i never have any fossil spiders i have uh, eurypterids which are oh. all that different, but uh <laughs> yeah fossil spiders are really rare there's only a few locales that actually have them so that's not too surprising they're thin and fragile and hard to maintain. And there was a counterfeit one uh, somebody actually published on a few years back that was oh. found in China, or supposedly found in China, but a lot of it had been drawn on with a pen. And the yeah. person that faked it did a fantastic job. <laughs> yes, uh, unlike the creationists who can't do a fantastic job of faking the science at all. <laughs> okay, well, I think this should be a good place to stop. Thank you, everyone, for coming by. Thank you. Yeah, we, I know we got up to at least, we got up to about 80 or so concurrent viewers. So that's good. So uh, again, thanks for stopping by. I will end it right here. And uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, uh, please. All right. So long, everyone. Thanks for coming by. Thank you. Oh.